says the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition and individual plaintiffs filed lawsuits against last year that described the bureaucratic morass encountered by felons trying to find out if they were eligible to vote. The lawsuit outlined months long delays and responses to requests for advisory opinions, many of which not offer resolution about voter eligibility. My question is, if you do, if you cannot vote because you still owe fees and fines, then why is the supervisor of elections allowed to give you a voter registration card? Sounds to me like that's a good excuse to put people back into prison. It's recidivism via registering to vote. You're pulling them back into the system on purpose. If you're a felon, do you feel that you should have the opportunity to vote once again? If that vote has been taken away from you because of you being in prison. If you are someone who feels that they don't deserve the, the vote again, let me know why in the comments. There was a vote that happened back in 2018. I remember this because, well, it was my first vote ever cast. My first vote in 2018 was for the Democratic uh, mayor. I'm sorry, the Democratic, yeah. Well, Mayor uh, Andrew Gillum, he was running for governor and he was running on things like Medicare for all, right? But there was a ballot initiative in 2018. And that ballot initiative gave former felons the right to vote again. Once they exited out of prison and they paid their time, they have the right to vote again. And when it passed, we were celebrating, right? It passed in Florida. In Florida, red state, Florida. We said, you paid your time? All right, you get that privilege to vote back. I thought voting was a right, not a privilege, but what do I know? But then the Republicans said, hey, wait, 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 wait. We can't make it that easy. You can't express your your voice and then get this right. No, we got to throw a monkey wrench in there. So we're going to talk about that monkey wrench. We're going to talk about the vote that happened. And then we'll get into a little bit of good news as well and what has happened. So... Let's go here and let's start. Think all the way back to August of 2005, right? When I was in South Florida, in Miami, Dade County, when I was homeless, I was hooked on crack cocaine, unemployed, recently got out of prison and I was standing by these railroad tracks and I was waiting on a train to come so I can jump in front of it. Desmond Mead knows how to fight. He's battled his demons, his addiction, and his homelessness. Then he undertook a fight that would have huge consequences for the nation's largest swing state, the right of felons to vote. And he won until he lost. If the system was working properly, then I would not have had to organize everyday citizens from all walks of life to actually launch a ballot initiative, right? This issue would have been taken care of a long time ago. Amendment 4 passed in 2018, returning voting rights to some 1.4 million felons.
1.4 million people given back the right to vote. Can that swing an election? You and I both know that as someone who is what we call post duopoly, I am not a Democrat. I am not a Republican. I do not see any type of true working for the people in either one of those parties. With that being said, I believe voting is a right, not a privilege. And in doing so, I feel that giving felons the right to vote after they come out of prison, after they serve their time, I feel is a step in the right direction. Because if they can get a driver's license once again after leaving prison, right? Why not give them the right to be able to vote again? You know? But that's a lot of people. Let's continue. But Republicans in the state quickly responded by passing a law requiring all outstanding legal fees and fines to be paid before people with felony convictions could cast a ballot. Many activists say the new law is a poll tax, keeping mostly black people from being able to cast ballots. So Meade leveraged his network again, this time to pay off those fines and fees. We rallied the entire country. Over 88,000 people, right, donated over $25 million, right, to our fines and fees fund. While trying to get those paid off, Meade's group was also trying to register as many people as possible. Hello, how you doing, sir? My name is Connie Burton and I'm with Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. What happened with the young man at the door? Uh, he seemed to kind of be bewildered a little bit and honest by just indicating he didn't know. He didn't know that uh, voter registration had stopped. And he also said that he couldn't vote because he had a background challenge. And I just felt like, wow, this is the person I've been looking for all day. Now, hang on. How many people have a felony on their record? There's a lot of people who have felonies on their record. And just because they have that, does that take, should that take away their right to vote once they've served their time? What if this felony possession of a controlled substance, right? And the possession was really technically a victimless crime where you were using it for yourself. You didn't harm anyone except for yourself. And then you go to prison, you serve the felony conviction, and then you get out. But now, because of that, your right to vote, your right to actually speak is revoked. And the fact is that we, the people of Florida, gave them back that right. We gave it back. But now they have to pay back all these fees and fines before they can vote? So what this basically is, is it's not only targeting Black people, but it's targeting poor people because they do not want people who are poor, who are heavily affected by this capitalist system, to vote. And even more so, the people who are poor and Black who say that both parties are trash and they walk away from the duopoly, that's their worst nightmare. 
people who would be poor like myself, like if I had a felony conviction, they could say, well, you haven't paid us back. So therefore you can't vote. Because somebody like me who's post duopoly, there's many people who realize that, for instance, how many people would vote against the Democrat and Republican in the state? It was just released that the Republicans, I forget in what state, which state it was, but they're trying to kick the Libertarian Party off the ballot, the Republicans. The Democrats are have been trying to kick the Green Party off the Wisconsin ballot. So the thing is that they want you to stay within the frame of the duopoly. They want you to stay within the confines of a system that will keep you exploited because you have good cop and bad cop, but in the end, they're still both cops. They still want to get you. It's the same thing with the Democratic and Republican parties, right? And so this is a means to take the voice away from the people who are the most affected by the system in a negative sense. Let's continue. Connie Burtman is trying to get people into the booth but a new investigation shows state Republican efforts to keep felons from voting is working. Only 31,400 registered to vote since January of 2019. Out of 1.4 million, 34,000? That's an extremely low number compared to how many they could have actually uh, registered. Since January of 2019, a small fraction of the state's former felons. Do you feel like Governor DeSantis is implementing the will of the people right now? Oh, no way. I, 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 absolutely not. You know, I, I, I think it's the contrary. You know, people have voted for second chances. And here's a beautiful part, that we brought people together from all walks of life, all political persuasions. Over a million people that voted for Amendment 4 also voted for him, right? Which showed that we had a broad cross-section of support for second chances. The ones Hang on. Now, another thing I want to say about this is that people will say that Ron DeSantis believes in democracy. No, he doesn't, because this is expanding democracy. Giving former felons the right to vote again is expanding democracy. Wait, hang on. If you agree with Donald Trump getting the right to vote for himself in the 2024 election, if you agree, and if you agree that that it, that your vote, your voice should not be paywalled, even if you're conservative, you should agree that people who are felons should have the right to vote again, former felons. And what the Republican Party did, the party of Trump did, is absolutely wrong. Also, while we're on the subject of Trump, wasn't it Donald Trump that passed the First Step Act, which he basically helped release a lot of nonviolent uh, felons? That's what Donald Trump did, right? Wouldn't it have been a beautiful thing if Donald Trump release those nonviolent felons, and then they also got their right to vote again. Imagine how many of those voters would have actually voted for Donald Trump if they had the right to vote again. But because Ron DeSantis blocked it, he stepped on his own toes. Think about it. He stepped on Donald Trump's toes. Because there, some of them felons could have said, you know what? Donald Trump, he actually did it. And they would have voted for Donald Trump because he actually affected their lives in a positive way with the First Step Act. But then here comes little Ronnie 
Ronnie came in and said, no, you don't get a voice. Me. Sorry, I made him sound like Ted Cruz. But the point is, that's what happened. Donald Trump, and, and the fact that Donald Trump was actually thinking about picking Ron DeSantis as vice president, says a lot about Donald Trump too. But the fact that the Ron DeSantis did that, they never really truly cared about expanding democracy. That's used, just used as an excuse. All right. So our board now represent what we our calls right now. Amendment four. Return of citizen, right? Mm -hmm. What we stand on? Amendment four. four. Let my people move. Let my people Y'all go in there and do it for me. Amen. On the same day President Trump cast his ballot in Palm Beach, Vino Holloman cast his first ballot in 20 years. He's registered in Gadsden the county with the highest percentage of newly registered voters who serve time for a felony. Who did you vote for in there today? Joe Biden, Harris, Ooh. you know, got to get rid of Trump. <laughs> Sorry, Trump, but yeah. Do you have a lot of friends or family that can't? You know why he said sorry, Trump? Because the first step that. But guess what? <laughs> And my thing is, it's like, look, if I were him, I'd be eating those words right now because I'd be like, mm, I can't believe I voted for Joe Biden. Because Joe Biden is the reason why Donald Trump has the power that he has right now. Mm -mm. But at the same time, I am still happy that he has his right, he had his right return. And ultimately, everybody, <laughs> really, in my opinion, you know, bar for some you know, horrible people who have done some horrible crimes should have the right to vote. But it's weird. Vote in this election? I'm sure I do. How does that make you think about your vote? It counts. It counts. Our votes count. You know, just the more you get, the better it is. Do you think that returning citizens can swing the vote here in Florida? Sure. Yes, of course. Of course. It just take people to push them. You know, if they don't know about it, then they won't do it. But voters like David Jones are still in limbo. He wants to vote, but can't afford to pay off what he owes. How much are your outstanding fines and fees? 1500 Yeah. I went to the courthouse I don't know, a couple of years ago to check to see how much it was, and it was 1500 Explain how FRRC is trying to help you right now. Well, from what I understand that they pay off fines and fees for ex-felons. So I fell in that category. They said that anything up to $1,500, they can pay it, you know, just pay it right away. Do you think you will be able to vote on November 3rd? I do. I do. I have faith that I do, that I will be able to. Sorry about that. But as far as I can see, I love that there's a program to help people being able to pay off their fines and fees to be able to vote again, but that shouldn't have to exist. I honestly think that this law against it should be overturned. And what we know now is that the law that they did and making it so that former felons now have to pay fines and fees before they can vote again. Some of them do not know, even if they paid it off, they don't know if the ability to vote is restored or not. They made it ambiguous and convoluted. They just don't know. 
And so this brings us to our article that I would like to share. Now, this is mildly good news. Uh, it is in the right direction, but we should still not have a paywall when it comes to former felons being able to vote. So this is out of Orlando Weekly. It says proposal could add clarity to voters' constitutional amendment to restore felon voting rights. The blurb reads, it is crucial that individuals seek to vote, especially during an election season, receiving clear guidance on their eligibility. So this came out a few days ago. So it says state election officials are moving forward with an updated process aimed at providing more clarity for people seeking to determine if they're eligible to vote after a federal lawsuit over the handling of the constitutional amendment that restored voting rights to felons who completed their sentences. A proposed rule released Thursday by the State Division of Elections includes a one-page form for felons requesting what are known as advisory opinions from state lawyers to clarify they're eligible to vote. The proposal will give state election officials two weeks to determine whether a form is complete, require notification of the felon within 14 days of the specific deficiency or the need for any specific additional information, and mandate that the state respond within 90 days of receiving the request for an advisory opinion. Desmond Mead, Executive Director for the Florida Rights Rest Restoration Coalition, who helped advocate for the 2018 Constitutional Amendment, called the proposal a step forward by the state. So, moving on to, says, confusion over voter eligibility stems from the controversial 2019 law that Governor Ron DeSantis and Republican-controlled legislator approved to carry out the constitutional amendment which said voter voting rights would be restored upon completion of all terms of their sentence, including role or pro, parole or probation. The amendment excluded people convicted of murder or felony sexual offenses. The 2019 law required felons to pay financial, legal financial obligations, fees, fines, and other court costs associated with their convictions before they could be eligible to vote. But tracking down records related to sentencing has been problematic, time-consuming, and in some instances, impossible, according to election supervisors and lawyers familiar with the process. It says, in addition, lawmakers at the Santa Behest in 2022 created the Office of the Elections, Crimes, and Security. Since then, more than two dozen people have been e arrested for voting illegally. Many of the people who were arrested said they were convicted felons who believed they were eligible to vote and were provided voter registration cards by election officials. It says the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition and individual plaintiffs filed lawsuits again last year that described the bureaucratic morass encountered by felons trying to find out if they were eligible to vote. The lawsuit outlined months-long delays in responses to requests for advisory opinions, many of which not offer resolution about voter eligibility. My question is, if you do, if you cannot vote because you still owe fees and fines, then why is the supervisor of elections allowed to give you a voter registration card? Sounds to me like that's a good excuse to put people back into prison. It's recidivism via registering to vote. You're pulling them back into the system on purpose. That's what you're doing. You want those people back in prison. Ron DeSantis wants those people back into prison because they dare try to vote because they dare register. That's who Ron DeSantis is. And so now these people who had records in the past that served their time are coming back to try to vote. And now because they dare try to, now it's illegal for them because they didn't pay, because they didn't have enough money, because their vote is based on their income. 
Their vote is based on their economic status, their ability to speak of, or to their government is based on the money in their pockets or based on the money they have in their bank account. Is that real democracy? Is that democratic? And people can go, oh, well, if they did a crime, then that's on their, that's on them. So you're saying that if you drank and drive and you got felony DUI, but you didn't harm anybody, your right to vote should be revoked after you serve your time? So you don't believe in second chances. What about the people who have done nothing wrong, but they still got a felony? What about them? How many people that you love had a felony? How many people that you revere have had a felony? How many people who are in government have done something wrong and they probably got a felony? So you believe, do you believe that Donald Trump should no longer have the right to vote because he committed felonies? That's my thing, right? And people want to go, well, they shouldn't have done it. Well, then Donald Trump should have done what he did, did, did he? Joe Biden should have done what he did, did he? Because guess what? If you're a liberal, then guess Joe Biden also committed felonies too. And guess what? <laughs> after he gets out of office, some people are going to come try to come after him, especially for the Hunter Biden laptop issue. So if you're a liberal and you're shaking your head and nodding your head about what I said about Trump, oh, you better be doing the same thing about Joe Biden too. So the thing is, it's like that's what that's what gripes me about these people. They talk about. They talk a, a good game about, oh, we're for democracy until it's actually time to get people or allow people to ex exercise their right for democracy. Anyway, let's continue. It says, after mediation between the state and the plaintiffs, election officials held a rural development workshop in June. During the workshop, Leon County Supervisor of Elections, Mark Ely, pointed to a backlog of people who are uncertain about their voting statuses. He says, we are hearing that our voters and prospective voters who are, frankly, as they told me, they're concerned about whether they should try to get registered because they just don't know what their status is. It is very difficult to determine that. You literally have people who are afraid to, excuse me, afraid to register to vote because they're afraid they'll be arrested. Imagine being afraid to register to vote because you're afraid you'll be arrested? This is the Okoe massacre all over again. The Okoe massacre. The Okoe massacre happened in the early 20th century to a bunch of Black people who dared try to vote. And they were murdered in Ocoee, Florida, for trying to vote. Now you have a lot of Black people, particularly, who are in fear of being arrested because they dared try to vote. <laughs> it's the Ocoee massacre all again, all over again, man. It says the proposed rule on Thursday, they will require advisory opinions to include one of three responses. First one is, you are eligible to register to vote. Next one, you are ineligible to register to vote. Or the third one, the Division of Elections lacks credible and reliable information concerning your eligibility to register or to vote. 
Therefore, based on your good faith belief that all terms of the sentence have been satisfied, the information available to the division and the division's review of available information, nothing precludes you from registering and voting. It says the revamp process likely will not be finalized before the October 7th deadline to register to vote in the fall election. So they're talking about streamlining and it says for years, uh, we have advocated the need for reforms on the front end of the election process, considering that there was no deadline in place before this updated process will help ensure the clarity and assurances for Floridians on their voting eligibility. People's lives in the election systems will be improved by these changes. So that is the article. And hopefully this system will happen where people can know, well, look, your voting rights have been restored or they won't get in trouble if it hasn't. And then they go, well, we didn't know. So there has to be some clarity in this process, but this process shouldn't have to exist in the first place. I'm going to put this to you, right? Because a lot of people think, well, it's just to vote for either one of the two parties. No, you can also vote third party here in Florida, the Libertarian Party and the Green Party. And I think, I think Dr. Is Dr. Uh, Cornell West, I think he's registered also, uh, I think he has ballot access here in Florida too. But you can vote outside of duopoly, but really importantly, you can vote on ballot initiatives. How many former felons who get the right to vote again would vote yes on amendments like Amendment 1, which talks about uh, giving the school board the ability to either be a, a partisan election or not? Or what about Amendment 3, which I spoke about last week, which legalizes recreational marijuana? Or how many of those 1.4 million that got that supposedly gets their voting rights restored would vote in favor of the next ballot initiative, Amendment 4, that I'll be talking about in a little bit, about abortion. How many of them would vote in favor of it? In 2020, we literally passed a $15 an hour minimum wage in Florida, in a red state. We passed that. And now we're on our way to being $15 an hour by 2026. We're at $12 an hour now. Uh, next month, we're hitting 13 But people who are former felons, if they get the right to vote back, that's what? What if we are able to raise it even, even higher, to make the base even higher? What if we Floridians got on the ballot a single payer health care bill as a ballot initiative in Florida? How many of those people who are poor who are former felons would vote for that. You see, you see the I, I see the hamster running on the wheel in your head right now. This is why I think it is deeply important that we talk about this issue because ultimately it's about the voice of the people being heard. Um, 
I have something else that I want to play. Um, I'll get into that in a second. Let me see. I think I had something else. I had a. I had another piece that I wanted to talk about. Oh, there was this uh, video. Was that a video? I can't remember. Let me see. There was another. Um, I'm sorry, guys. Um, what was it? It was. Oh. see uh Yeah, there was this, there was a, um, ah, here it is. I also wanted to show show this as well. I don't know why I, delete, I deleted that tab. My apologies, guys. Okay, so I also wanted to share this. And here's my, here's one, another point of mine. If somebody who has committed a felony is in prison in a particular area and you're counting them in that particular district for when it comes to how they're represented in the house right in the house of representatives then their voice should be heard if you're going to count them in that way, to be a part of the population, their voice deserves to be heard. Let's, let me show you this. It says, your body being used where prisoners who can't vote still fill voting districts. So, ooh. sorry about that. So, it says Robert Alexander has been away home for more than a decade. He spends his nights spent locked up behind walls topped with barbed wire. Prison kind of gives you that feeling like you're on an island. So it says that's from uh, Alexander, who is getting his bachelor's degree uh, in Bible studies. It says clad in an oversized gray sweatshirt and under fluorescent lights under the visiting room of Wisconsin's oldest state prison. He is more than 70 miles from his last address in Milwaukee. It says, but if Alexander and his more than 1,200 fellow prisoners are still incarcerated at Welcome Correctional Institution, next census day, April 1st, the Census Bureau will officially consider them residents of Welcome, Wisconsin, for the 2020 national headcount. That's because since the first U.S. census in 1790, the federal government has included incarcerated people in the population counts of where they, they were in prison. The technical detail of a little known policy can have an outsized impact on prison towns across the US for the next decade. It says in many cases, rural, predominantly white towns see their population numbers boosted by population counts from prisons disproportionately made up of Latin and Latin people. In turn, states which control how voting districts are drawn and local community governments can use those numbers to form districts filled predominantly with people who are locked behind bars and cannot vote in almost all states. Maine and Vermont are the exceptions. Officials in some prison towns have come up with creative ways to avoid forming voting districts made up of primarily of prisoners. 
but in many others, political lines are drawn around prisons in a way that districts deride as prison gerrymandering. So if you can see here, uh, says to, to, uh, map, see how government's forming their boundaries. So here's Florence, Arizona, right? Uh, it says the total population in 2010 incarcerated was 17,700, but not incarcerated, it's only 7,836. Says Florence avoids the issue of drawing districts around prisons by holding at large elections where all voters choose candidates from the same pool. The town does, however, acknowledge that it benefits from the census counting incarcerated people in its population since local governments often receive grant money determined by those official counts. Uh, here's Grifton Village, Ohio. So it's the third district in Grif Grafton Village containing the Lorraine and Grafton Congressional Institutions has roughly the same number of registered voters as the other three districts in the village, despite dwarfing those districts in graph geographic size. The village has petitioned the state of Ohio to exclude incarcerated people from its population count including them would have forced it to officially be considered a city and require Grafton Village to spend more on public resources. So the incarcerated outnumbers them from 4,045 to 2,591 respectively. And then Oldham County, Kentucky. It says in Oldham County, the commission decided after 2010 census to exclude incarcerated people from its counts when attempting to draw magistrate districts of equal population. Albert Harrison, who led that commission, said he made the decision to avoid giving a disproportional representational advantage to the area that surrounds the prisons. Harrison, who is now a county magistrate, represents District 3, which is one of the two districts that contains prisons. The area around the prisons, known as Buckner, had roughly as many people incarcerated as permanent residents as of the last census. So that's 4,216 compared to non-incarcerated are 56,100. So, says a recent study about Pennsylvania State Legislative District by Villanova University Associate Professors highlights the impact this process can have on the political voice of incarcerated people's home communities. It found that a substantial likelihood that Philadelphia would gain additional majority minority district for Pennsylvania State House if prisoners incarcerated in the state were counted as residents of their last known address. The incarcerated are not only missing from their communities but they're also advan advantaging other communities. Still, the issue of whether to count prisoners for census numbers have been split largely among partisan lines. Most supporters who want change the way incar want to change the way incarcerated are counted like our Democrats, while Republicans generally want to keep things the way they are. 2015, when the Census Bureau was collecting public comments about this rules for counting people in prisons, Thomas Hoffner, a prominent Republican redistricting strategist who died in 2018, warned against adjusting prisoners' numbers. Hoffeller expressed the concern that the actual effect on reappointment and reapportionment, I'm sorry, and redistricting is not clearly known for individual states. So says this change is being encouraged by Democrat or liberal organizations and could involve a Census Bureau, yet another political conflict. So the problem is that you have some areas where they have a huge amount of incarcerated people, where they're counting them as part of their census, but the thing is, is like those numbers will help benefit that town, even though they are incarcerated and they don't get the benefits of that census count. They don't get to voice, you know, 
their concerns. They don't get to vote when it comes to those elections, yet they're still counting. So I just wanted to bring that up because I thought that was important when it comes to how people in uh, these districts who are incarcerated get counted, but they don't get the reap any of the benefits because they're incarcerated. Neither do they have the ability to vote even though they are incarcerated. And so I find it, I find it really deplorable how they will use uh, the people who are incarcerated to bump up their numbers, but the people, there, but there's no representation for them. And there are certain some countries who actually allow their felons to vote. They actually hold elections for the leaders of government and prisons. And, and they even have debates in prisons. They will have debates. The presidential candidates or the candidates for office will have debates in those prisons. So the prisoners can see, oh, well, this person will represent our country better. And this is in some social democracies. Javier, you're right. Javier says, can't let prisoners vote or they'll vote out the people making private prison contracts. You can't let the slaves vote because if the slaves vote, then they'll vote out the slave owners. You guys know Bill and Hillary Clinton? Did you guys know that they used slave labor in the governor's mansion when he was governor of Arkansas? Interesting, right? Yeah. Uh, so, yes, when it comes to stories like this, I hope that we can push for the formerly incarcerated, at the very least, to not have to be paywalled into voting again. And I would like that they are not only have it restored, but then uh, they do not have to face being rejected from voting based on their economic status. Because I, it's just, because how would you feel if you owe taxes to the state and your ability to vote was revoked because, oh, well, you owed state taxes and you have not paid them yet. So we're going to withhold your ability to vote. How would you feel? I think we got to put that in perspective. Now, if you want to argue certain people who have done felonies when it comes to sex offenses or murders, Okay, we can have that conversation, right? But what about all the other people who are in jail for grand theft, right? Who or who are in prison for felony possession? How many people are in prison under felony for failure to pay child support? It's crazy, man. It's crazy on his on his face. So yeah, so I, I'm hoping that this changes because we really need to change in this system, especially when it comes to uh, people being able to have the right to vote. And this affects largely poor and black people in this state. So yeah. Let's hope we can change this. The only real change is that we have to physically change this system altogether. But we can do it. We just have to realize our power. Thank you so very much for watching my channel. And I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content, 
that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jvfond. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. Forehead kisses and have a beautiful day.